Next we have Ben. Ben Page is a filmmaker, adventurer and photographer. He spends his time traveling to some of the world's remotest corners under human power in search of wild and diverse adventures and experiences. He recently completed a three-year bike ride around the world. Please welcome Ben Page. Hello. So yeah, back in um, 2014, I was a fresh-faced university graduate, 22 years old, and um, for the previous years, I'd been dreaming up of this bike ride around the world, kind of inspired by a, a ginger Yorkshire bloke a little bit. Um, <laughs> But yeah, this was my route. I, I flew to the bottom of, of South America and then began what became a three-year bike ride around the world. But very early on, I decided that I wanted to teach myself how to take some photographs. I thought this would be a really nice way to, um, to, to learn a new skill with all that time that I was going to have on the road. And down in South America, I mean, the landscapes are absolutely stunning. So taking photos is quite an easy thing to do. Um, but you've got to get to those landscapes. And what I kind of realized is that this classic bike touring setup, which is what I set off with, um, was too heavy and too slow and too difficult to, to, to get moving, but it took me a really long time to be able to get a new bike, to be able to allow myself to get to these wild and remote spaces. Um, and that actually happened 15 months into the ride, fast forwarding all the way through South America and much of North America, and I found myself in the Canadian Arctic here. And luckily I'd managed to sweet talk a bike company to, into giving me a, a, a big fat bike, which kind of really changed what the trip became. It allowed me then to, to travel to some... Um, yeah, to kind of, it opened up the map, because bikes often you get kind of tra trapped onto going on roads and big tracks, but this kind of allows you to, to make a few silly mistakes and cross big rivers uh, with the help of, of some Mongolian horsemen as well, which was really handy. Um, but this is in Asia, so this is a year and a half through the journey, um, and the first time I'd really experienced a language barrier. Um, my school level Spanish got me through South America, and my school level English got me through uh, North America. Um, <laughs> But riding through Asia, it seemed like every single country had a different script, had a different language, and this kind of has all sorts of different problems. And, and one instance is, uh, is trying to find directions. And, you know, if anyone's been to, to, to China, for example, asking people for directions there, you get pointed in all sorts of directions. Um, or, on one instance, I, uh, I spoke to an old man and said, do you mind if you, um, if you tell me if, if this path leads over to the, to the next valley, to the next town? And he turns around, walks into his house, comes back, hasn't uttered a word, and returns with these two kittens. <laughs> and he spends the next 30 minutes insisting I take these kittens with me. Um, <laughs> but just as a, as a little aside as well, this was one of the most bizarre experiences I think I had. Which This was in the middle of, uh, of Mongolia, in this small little village. And this was actually quite common throughout much of Central Asia and Mongolia. There were Morrison's bags absolutely everywhere. The smallest little shop had Morrison's bags. And I think when the 5p plastic bag charge came in, Morrison's must have had millions of the stuff. And they shipped it all over to, to Asia. So that was quite like a little taste of home. But with bikes, bikes is a really engaging way to travel. Um, you get the opportunity to meet lots of different people. If you're the weird guy on a weird-looking bike, lots of people come over and talk to you. Lots of people, well, they, they spend a good 20 minutes trying to find where the motor is as they're insistent it's a, it's a motorbike. Um, and then when they kind of accept that there's no motor, they go and have a, a lovely ride. And that's a great way to kind of be introduced to people and to kind of break down a few, few barriers that are there. Um, but speaking of breaking... I was often going into places where I was carrying the bike, pushing the bike, and kind of putting it through lots of misery. Um, and when things go wrong, you've got to try and find a way to MacGyver the situation to try and fix it. Uh, now, this obviously, for anyone who's been bike touring, happens quite a lot, and you can always find a magical way to do it, but one of the most difficult times was when I unfortunately snapped a crank when I was in, uh, in Zambia. Now, I didn't have any money to be able to buy a new one and ship it over. Um, I hadn't really spoken to my bike sponsors, so they hadn't, hadn't delivered anything, but I came up with this ingenious solution, which was um, to drill a hole further down the crank, so basically shorten this whole pedal and, uh, and find the biggest, fattest bolt that I could and put it into, the, into, the, into this new, newly built drilled hole, um, which is fantastic and quite funny, and all the locals were laughing because I was like, ah, it's going to be a couple of days, it's going to be wonderful, um, cycle along, but I actually rode with that for about a month and a half, 3,000 kilometers. So it destroyed all my shoes, it destroyed my feet, it destroyed my, my knees and my ankles, but um, it kind of just taught me that, you know, you can always figure out a situation when it goes a little bit awry. Um, but riding a bike, as I said before, it can take you to only a few places, and sometimes you've got to leave the bike alone and, uh, and go and climb a hill. So this is in the Maasai Mara in, uh, in, in Kenya and in Tanzania, 
And it's a massive expanse of land, and, and you can't really see it from the ground. You've got to get high, so I went to climb a mountain. And halfway up this mountain, as I was walking up, no pass, and just kind of like trying to find my way, um, realized I'm not going to make it to the top in time, so find this cave. I thought, I've never slept in a cave. Let's go and sleep in a cave, light a fire, fall asleep. Wonderful. Until the middle of the night, about 12, 12 o'clock, 1, 1 a.m., um, start to hear all this rustling outside. Now, this is the, the, like the Masai Mara. There's lions, there's all sorts of hyenas and, and scary things. And I've had run-ins with wild animals in the past, and I didn't want any more. Um, and all these noises just start like building and building and building up outside, the, uh, outside this cave. And I'm kind of sitting up. I've got my little opinal knife, um, ready to kind of like fight whatever comes in. Got my head torch. This noise comes up. I start screaming and shouting, fla- flashing this head torch. Screams and shouts come back at me. And it turns out that it was about 15 uh, Masai tribes people who'd come up to the cave for a, um, for a ceremony during the evening, and they were just as shocked to see you know, a random Mzungu white guy at the back of this cave in the middle of nowhere, as I was very, very pleased to see them without their gnashing teeth. Um, but I guess we've all kind of touched on why we've got to go on adventures and trips and journeys, and why it's important. Um, but certainly one of the things that drew me to going on a, on a journey was the sense of coming back home again. I started at the furthest point I could think of, and I wanted to come back home. Um, and it's very rare we get those opportunities to go away for such a long period of time and then to reevaluate what it means to be you know, um, a citizen in where we live now um, and, and really puts into perspective what, what this sense of home is. And this was probably the most stark when I'd crossed over, well, you probably all know this view, don't you? Um, crossed over from the English Channel, arrived back in England for the first time after three years, arrived at night, climbed up onto the, onto the well, climbed over the, the do not enter signs. Um, and slept there for the night and woke up to my first sunrise. And it was really, really beautiful. And it kind of gave me a sense of what it meant to, uh, to, um, yeah, to see the White Cliffs of Dover. And, and, and the journey was ostensibly all on my own. Uh, long periods of time, like a year uh, um, at a time at, at once on my own. But the take-home message was, you know, you come back home and, and, and there's friends and family. And it's all good fun to go off and do things on your own. But it's... It's when you've got that family and those friendships to, to come back home to makes it all worthwhile. So, hey, there we go. Thank you very much.